Hi, my name is Mike Burns. I'm COO at Everge Group. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation on the overview of our precision fit methodology. Today we're going to cover the history and the evolution of our methodology. We're going to compare it to other methodologies in the trade. We're also going to talk about the key components, the key concepts, the guiding principles, the benefits of the methodology, and we're going to, throughout the presentation, give you examples of how we've used it over the years. The methodology, as you might imagine, has its origins at the company founding. In the early 1990s, the press was full of stories of failed SAP, failed PeopleSoft, and failed Oracle implementations. As Esteban founded the company, he knew there must be a better way. There must be a straightforward process that avoided these disasters and, and, it, and enabled success for our customers. He founded the methodology that we're going to go over today. It's been updated and continuously improved as we've added practice. We added the Siebel practice five years after the company's founding. A few years later, we added the Siebel analytics practice, which became Oracle Business Intelligence, the master data management practice a few years after that, and now all of our cloud solutions with Oracle. And as those practices get added, we continuously improve our methodology. This methodology is fully integrated in our SharePoint system and we need your help in maintaining that system. So let's talk about what the methodology is not and compare it to those other methodologies that it is not. First of all, you may hear the waterfall methodology. We're also going to cover an agile and a scrum methodology. The waterfall is, the concept behind a waterfall is you you can't begin one stage of the methodology unless you've completely finished the prior stage. And with custom off-the-shelf software that we develop, such as Oracle software, um, that's just simply not acceptable. If you can't go into design and you can't go into development without completing the previous stage, that's going to lead to unnecessary delays and the users aren't going to actually see the system until it's too late. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have what you may have heard of as an Agile methodology. And there's some really neat concepts in the Agile methodology that we've actually adopted in Precision Fit. It is really an incremental concept. It's an iterative concept. Um, the requirements and solutions are allowed to evolve through collaboration amongst us and our clients. But, as you can see, in 2001, this manifesto was published, the Agile Manifesto. There's a couple of things that we really aren't allowed to do in order to help our clients succeed. One of the things in the Agile Manifesto is that they welcome, in fact, encourage changing requirements, even late in development. And as you're going to see in your career at Everge, as we want to manage scope with our precision fit methodology, we certainly want to encourage changing requirements to a point, but not late in development. That's going to be costly. It's going to cause budget overruns, time overruns, and dissatisfied clients. I'm not going to go through the rest of the Agile Manifesto, but realize that the precision fit methodology has adopted many of those key elements that we do view as positive. Another derivative of the Agile methodology is actually called Scrum, and it also encourages requirements to evolve as a function of time, but it's also mo even more informal than Agile. You basically have a daily Scrum meeting and you shoot the bull, if you will, and you say, what did you get done yesterday? What are you going to do today? And what are your impediments? And although there's certain nice things about the collaboration aspect of this, it's too informal for us to execute with excellence for our clients. So let's talk a little bit about precision fit and specifically focus as we, as we learn about precision fit, what is the end in mind with precision fit? What are the benefits we're going to derive for our customers and enable their success? Well, first of all, the way the precision fit is constructed is it lowers the risk. First of all, it lowers the risk that users are going to see it earlier in the system and not later in the system, later in the process. So they're actually going to be encouraged and build momentum throughout the project. But it lowers the risk of having some sort of catastrophic failure at the end of the project. It's rapid deployment. You see the application develop before your eyes. It encourages speed. We have the speed built into our project plan. Obviously, if you lower risk and you develop things faster, you're going to lower costs, which is always something that we're trying to do for our clients. It's very competitive. The implementations that we bid on have to have an affordable aspect to them also. And really, I feel one of the most important things is 
it drives higher quality and higher user acceptance. And, and piggybacking off that, it actually drives ownership. One of the key elements you're going to see in Precision Fit is user adoption. And if users are participating in our Precision Fit methodology, then as a function of time, they're going to own the system. Now, really some important tips for you to know. We have customers all over the board. We have customers in public sector and commercial. We have customers that are in smaller companies. We have customers that are larger and more multi-billion dollar conglomerates. And over the years, we've learned about our customers' willingness to work with us on Precision Fit. First of all, the larger the company is, the more they're going to cling desperately to this waterfall. And we need to resist that at every juncture. If we allow them to cling to waterfall, our methodology is not compatible with waterfall and we simply will not be successful. And we need to have those conversations up front during the sales cycle. Also, smaller companies tend to wing things and they tend to be really have no project management office, or if they do, they certainly have no structure and they're completely reliant upon us, which is generally a good thing, um, but it's something that needs to be managed. To execute our methodology with excellence, we really need the project management and the engagement managers built into the system. We've got to account for how we're going to manage our deliverables and how we're going to work our, with our clients to enable precision fit. So let's look at the methodology itself. Um, it's get, there's four stages, inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. Loosely, you can think of these as scoping and requirements, design, development, and uh, go live. Now, there's, there's several key principles that you'll see throughout, and we're going to speak throughout the rest of the presentation. One is active user involvement. We've got to get users from all business segments and from all layers of the organization, from the end users to management to executives. Users have to be involved in the development of our applications. Another key element that you'll see throughout Precision Fit is project management and change management. We have, with project management, we have a whole set of tools and templates, which you're learning about now. Um, those simply must be part of the implementation. And we've got change management processes to help manage the change within the organization. And another key piece of this is knowledge transfer, which we'll spend some time on. But it's, it's enabling that there's no surprises at the end of the project where our clients simply must have knowledge transferred to them throughout the project to where they're ready to be self-sustaining as they go live. So one thing that was mentioned in, in Precision Fit that you saw on that last diagram was prototyping. In fact, what we call iterative prototyping. And the concept here is once you have a design down, you show, you develop some of that design you show it to the customer, you get their feedback, you assess their feedback, you incorporate that feedback, and you do this continually through a loop until the application is ready to be accepted. Now, some guiding principles within our methodology, not just within prototyping, but within precision fit in general, is, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if we're going to have meetings, whether it's a prototype or not, if we're going to be discussing requirements, if we're going to be discussing design or development, you really need to conduct those meetings and those discussions, formal or informal, in front of the application so that you can see what, we, you can speak and teach to others what you know, and you can actually see what we're talking about in black and white. Occasionally, we want to see the applications in front of us that we're replacing, but generally, you want to avoid that because you don't want to just put uh, this, the old wine in a new bottle. You really want to you're, they bought these applications for a reason and we just don't, we want to look at the other applications that they're using now to understand their pain points, but we certainly don't want to fall into the temptation of just simply mimicking them. And now I already mentioned the second bullet, we've got to have user representatives from all business divisions and all levels of the organization as part of these prototypes. A little bit more about how prototyping works. In the top table you see an example of a, of a small CRM client that executed five prototypes prior to going to user, user acceptance testing and then go live. And you can see a key concept here, and it's a concept that we cover at the beginning of every prototype, is for this particular prototype, how many requirements have been identified, how many are sanctioned that are in scope and out of scope, and then 
for today's prototype exactly how many have been configured into the system. And as you can see, as a function of time, these prototypes were conduct conducted two to three weeks apart. As a function of time, they can see the application develop before their eyes. But by the time they get into user acceptance and go live, 100% of the requirements have been fulfilled. And they're not waiting three months, four months to see the very first prototype, to see the application for the very first time. Now, another thing we like to cover at the beginning of every prototype is in the second table, and this is an excerpt from one of our uh, CRM clients. But you can see, we like to kick off these prototype meetings with a handout that shows every single requirement that's been documented thus far, and is this particular requirement been fulfilled in this particular prototype. Again, the concept is you see the application develop before your eyes. Now here's an example from Harris Corporation. We actually did, this is a division called RFCD, the radio frequency devices. These are radios that are in the theaters of war and have actually, while we were doing this project, the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars were transpiring. And what Harris does is they get these radios in for repair and they have to turn them quickly around. And some of the times when they get them out for repair, they're actually in the theaters of war. And we put in a complete field service application for them based on Siebel. And as you can see, what, what you as part of eVerge and your project management team are going to do at the beginning of the project is you're going to determine what the, what the natural breakdowns are for these prototypes. For instance, with Harris, what we did, when I talk about breakdowns, I'm talking about time breakdowns, I'm talking about how you classify the set of business processes or modules, I'm talking about which groups or teams you involve in these particular prototypes. So in this example at Harris, we did prototypes two to three weeks apart. We had five to eight users in every single meeting. Um, prototypes also included key concepts such as data integration and data reporting, not just the functionality of the system itself. And as you can see, we laid out the first couple of prototypes were based on master data, such as account data, contact data, and asset data. And as a function of time, we worked into their processes and not just their master data, but barcode, RMAs as return material authorizations, receiving a camera or a radio in for repair, and uh, giving estimates on those repairs. We had inventory processes and we had shipping processes. And by prototype number nine, we did the entire thing end to end for a larger audience. Now, you can do things differently on your projects. Every one of our applications, such as CRM, ERP, HCM, uh, uh, MDM, and Business Intelligence, and Hyperion, they all take on a different nature, and the practice director is going to be speaking to you about how their unique characteristics are integrated into precision fit. But as an example, with this particular one, with barcode scanning as an example, if barcode scanning was complex, we, the project team may have decided to have actually two or three different prototypes for that, maybe a couple weeks apart. Same thing with all the other components that you see um, from prototype three through eight. If they're complex enough, it's okay to have a series of prototypes within a particular set, within a particular stream. Again, one of the other things that will happen is you'll find some tough nuts to crack here in, in something like uh, RMA creation. Maybe there's two or three design capers that are really difficult to fulfill the requirements with our application software. And what you may need to do there is have some special sessions where, you know what, Everge Group recommends that we have a special session on one aspect of RMA creation, and we're going to invite the same people, but we're going to focus just on these particular aspects. And as Everge consultants, we're going to give them design options. We're going to say, here's your three options, here's your costs and benefits, advantages and disadvantages of each. If we were in your shoes, this is what we would do. Here's what our other clients have done, and let them make the decision. Those are some of the key concepts with Precision Fit. Another example of one of our CRM clients, you can see we broke it down into about 19 different work streams, uh, 19 different prototypes that were work streamed. And you can see, just as I mentioned before, we've documented how many requirements are in that particular work stream, and as, as a percent of that total, which ones are targeted for completion in that particular prototype. Again, it's key to kick off the prototype meetings with facts. What, what are you going to see today? What percentage has been fulfilled? And, and give the handout that shows which ones are actually fulfilled. Now, I'm going to move from prototyping to another key element of our precision fit methodology, and that's knowledge transfer. And knowledge transfer means a lot of different things. What it doesn't mean is training. Our customers simply must go to 
training that are provided by our software partners. That's the only way that they're going to actually learn how to use the system. When I say knowledge transfer, what I'm talking about is the actual transfer of knowledge as to what we have done during the implementation as a function of time. Now, what we really need to do and make it part of our discipline in, with this methodology is starting the very first week of the project, our project managers and solution architects and, and developers and business analysts, we should collaborate and develop what we call a knowledge transition template. And this template should be shown at the beginning of every status meeting during the week. And as we have periodic uh, executive steering committee meetings or sponsor meetings, we also need to share that plan so that there's no surprises. And when I say this plan, I'm talking about a simple table or template that says who from eVerge is going to teach who from the client on what particular topic, by what date, using what mechanism. And as you can see, uh, with, with this particular example, there's, uh, we could be talking about adjustments, subscriptions, uh, CTI, Outlook integration, data quality, email response. So for those topics, we have to teach to them what we know so they can sustain the application after we leave and we have a satisfied customer. So this is a key piece. It differentiates our methodology and it differentiates eVerge from other firms out there and it's a big key to our success. When customers call our references, this is one thing that typically gets referenced as something that was very positive. Now I'm going to briefly cover some of the stages of precision fit in a little more detail. As I mentioned, the practice directors from CRM, ERP, HCM, MDM, BI, EPM, they're going to cover what's unique to their particular uh, practices and your particular practices. And so some of this may not be completely applicable, but generally speaking, these, this is how we present precision fit to our customers. The inception phase, where you're talking about there is, what are, the, what are the business objectives of the project? How are we going to measure those business objectives? So we can take a before and after picture and actually measure our success. Then we're doing discovery. We, don't, we want to discover what they're doing now, not to the point that we're going to mimic it, but to the point where we understand the pain and why they're trying to change. We're going to start doing standard system demonstrations of our applications so they know what they bought, so we can communicate with each other throughout the project. And of course, we're going to establish the environment the development environments and the test and staging environments that we're going to work within. You can see that each of those core activities have a, a mashing core set of deliverables that are delivered and approved by our clients as a, as a function of the phase. And as an example of business discovery, here's a particular aspect where we, we go into a project, we have uh, predefined processes in many of our practices that are based on the custom off-the-shelf software that we deliver. And we also have predefined templates with questions to help provoke uh, some of the requirements that we're going to eventually capture and some of the things that we want to understand about our clients. The next stage is known as elaboration. And you can see here's where we may have started some requirements gathering in the inception phase, but here's where we're going to do detailed requirements and we're going to try and solidify those requirements. Um, we actually take those requirements and we do what we call a fit assessment and a gap analysis to compare how those requirements are going to be met with our standard delivered functionality of our software that we're delivering. We actually start doing solution design and you can see we start the prototypes. Now generally speaking in the elaboration phase the first couple of prototypes quote unquote are used specifically to make sure that all requirements have not been forgotten. We have to capture during the first two prototypes I mentioned earlier pictures worth a thousand words when our when the participants on our project from our client side when they actually see the prototypes, they may have already gathered requirements, but the, invariably the first couple of prototypes we're going to do, especially in the elaboration phase, is going to provoke their thought, it's going to cause them to use their imagination, and they're actually going to think of things that they hadn't thought of before because they've been you know, in the paradigm of the old system. So the prototypes in the elaboration phase are key to lock down requirements. And you remember back earlier in the presentation I mentioned You've got the uh, Agile and the Scrum methodologies which actually encourage requirements to be captured throughout the project. We're really trying to freeze requirements in elaboration. If we capture requirements after elaboration, we're gonna, it's going to cost extra money to develop those and it's money that normally isn't budgeted. Here you see I mentioned a fit assessment. Here you see a fit assessment. We're actually capturing a particular requirement we're making some notes on it. We're actually comparing it to the custom off-the-shelf software 
software and we're actually determining the percent fit and what's going to be needed done. If the percent fit isn't 100%, do we have to do administrative changes, configura configuration changes, or customization? Finally, as requirements are frozen, as we're doing prototypes, we're going to continue prototypes, we're going to continue development in the construction phase. And here we actually complete the development cycle. We're doing most of the prototypes. It, as I mentioned in, in elaboration, the pro, those prototypes are meant to not only start to get the solution design right, but really to finalize requirements. The prototypes we're doing in, in the construction phase are specifically to not just freeze requirements, but to freeze the solution design, to give them an enduring solution design that will last ad infinitum and, and help achieve the business objectives and business aspirations of our clients. As you can see in construction, you're also doing some preparation for testing, you're doing some preparation for training, and all the things that you're going to need for the next phase, which is transition. In the transition phase, we're executing our testing with excellence. This can be user acceptance testing, system integration testing, um, everything beyond the unit testing that we've done in the development phase. We're also establishing the, the production environment and making sure that that's performance ready, and we actually have the go live and the production support. And as an example from a, a testing phase, here you can see during the transition phase, we have a whole quality assurance program in all of our practices that help ensure all of our test cycles are executed with excellence. Finally, you me I mentioned in the inception phase, one of the things that we do at the very beginning with a project charter is we want to measure the, the business objectives of this particular project. Not just the IT objectives, but the business objectives. What is this going to deliver if it's a CRM project or a BI project? What is this going to deliver where we can go back to our customer and said, Everge did what we said we were going to do, or in most cases, even more so. And what we have here is a project scorecard. We developed this in the inception phase, but we take the after picture um, once we go live and we can measure that as a function of time. Finally, as I wrap up Precision Fit, it's important for you to know that as we've evolved, as we originated Precision Fit and it's evolved as a function of time, it's built on some best practices, some leading practices that, that are that Everge has found and others have found to be true. If you execute these practices, you will succeed. If you fail in these practices, you will not succeed. And we have an entire governance model that you can also find in SharePoint and you're also getting trained on. And this governance model is meant to inspect our adherence to these particular practices. You can see here, I'm obviously not going to read through all of them, but across the, the components such as strategy, governance, user adoption obviously is a key, process, technology, you know, taking the technology such as Siebel, PeopleSoft, or the Oracle Cloud Solutions and really trying to exploit the power of that technology. Um, again, I think this is a very good slide to close with because it, it really hones in on what we're all about. If we govern against these leading practices and we execute with excellence with these, our customers will succeed and they will have an enduring application and we'll have a satisfied customer for a reference. So, I'd like to thank you for your time and I appreciate and please feel free to contact me or contact your practice director or team leader if you have any questions about this methodology whatsoever. Thank you.